everybody. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Uh, yes, I'm one of the uh, archaeology advisors at the Ministry of Defence. Uh, I work in the north and Scotland, so that covers everything from Lincolnshire all the way up to Cabroth and beyond. Uh, I'm not going to tell you too much about that because I could spend about an hour talking about the roles that we do. But one of the projects that we do, or one of the things that we do, uh, uh, Ministry of Defence initiative, is an archaeological project called Operation Nightingale, where, uh, as Moira said, we take wounded, injured, sick soldiers uh, and teach them archaeology or get them involved in archaeological projects across the MOD ranges. One of these was uh, Barry Budden. I'm going to tell you a little bit better about this, explain this a bit more. Uh, it was supported by Wessex Archaeology. Uh, they were the professional archaeologists on the ground because generally my role as the MOD archaeologist is basically to set up the projects to get them uh, rolling, get all the permissions in place, and then literally just talk rubbish to the veterans when I'm on site. So we actually have to have a professional archaeology company, uh, Wessex Archaeology, working with us. We also work with Breaking Ground Heritage, which is a veterans association. It's actually run by an ex-sergeant of the Royal Marines, uh, who was, he came on an Operation Nightingale project and then set up Breaking Ground Heritage through this, and he basically vets the vets. Uh, they give them all their instructions, they make sure that their mental health is looked after when they're on site, etc. and they basically give all those kind of coverages to them. So, <clears throat> as I say, we set up these projects one of the ones that we set up was a Barry Budden. It was, uh, for those that don't know, one second, see if this is working, wrong way. Barry Budden is just outside of Dundee, the little nose of land. Can you all see that marker there? Yeah. Uh, the little nose of land sticking out just on, uh, on Barry Budden, and the site itself is right in the centre of the ranges. You can see here the little red square is the actual site. It's a First World War training area. It was uh, dug uh, probably in uh, 1914, possibly a little bit further, uh, a bit later on. We're not entirely sure, but <clears throat> the entire area of Barry Budden has been used as a training area since the late 19th century. Uh, it's currently being used now as a modern training area. It's a live range, so there is live firing going on there. So it is, you know, quite dangerous when there's red flags up. Uh, the Royal Marines generally use it. Uh, the SAS have also been out there when we were actually working there in uh, August. The SAS, or the Hereford Hooligans, as they're also known, uh, were there training as well, uh, which was quite interesting to see. And the site that we were looking at, in particular, is this set of First World War training trenches. You can see the crenellations here of the frontline trenches here. Uh, this various large area of... Uh, communication trenches running back and forth. Uh, these are quite uh, substantial features in the ground. Now, uh, you know, we've already talked today about early medieval and things like that, but I'm of the opinion that archaeology started in 1914 and ended in 1918. Uh, everything before that is pretty much monkeys banging rocks together. <laughs> so from my point of view, as a military archaeologist, this is fantastic stuff to get involved with. Uh, we also had on site this feature, which is marked on Canmore as an Alan Williams turret. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but it's a big steel cupola, as you can see, this metal uh, box. This is the old uh, camp commandant. Uh, I don't remember his name because uh, I, I wasn't working when he came, but he always sneaks into my photographs. I should really learn his name. Uh, but we decided that we we're going to put some excavation trenches into these features, have a look at this potential Alan Williams turret, and just see if we could get any dating, see if we could find any uh, form and function of these trenches, see if there's any way of actually working out which parts of this entire uh, area had, uh, these, these uh, features have been dug first, and if we could, as I say, get some dating potentially. There have been some archaeological work done on these trenches uh, by Oxford. This was back in about 2006. This is way, way, way before my time uh, as an MOD archaeologist. And they produced uh, some very nice survey maps. They also did some uh, very early 3D uh, uh, plans of the trenches here. And so this gives you an idea, really, of just how deep some of these features are in the landscape. But before we started, uh, we have to add a, a safety brief. Uh, this is Gary Archer. Uh, here, he's the current TSO. If you ever work in the MOD, you have to get to know your acronyms. TSO means 
uh, training safety officer that are basically the, what we used to be called the camp commandants. He runs the site, he makes sure that uh, the units that are coming through are doing everything that they're supposed to be doing properly, uh, including us, because you know we are part of this whole MOD uh, setup. Uh, he also gave us a safety briefing as well. You can see uh, various amounts of munitions. I said it is a live, uh, a live range. So these are some of the kinds of things that we could potentially come across in the ground. Uh, thankfully, touch wood, uh, we didn't, and nobody ever got hurt. Uh, but we still had to have this safety brief before we do any work on any of the MOD lines. We also generally have a what's called an EOC, Explosive Ordnance Clearance Sweep, before we do any work on any of the trenches. So we're literally playing with fire sometimes. Uh, you may see this chap here. Bears a striking resemblance to me. It's not me. Uh, everybody has a doppelganger. Mine is an archaeological doppelganger. This guy works for Wessex. He lives in Sheffield. I'm from Rotherham, the town next over. And this is the first time we'd ever worked together and people kept confusing us. However, as you can see, I am far better looking than Sam. <laughs> so we explored some of the features of the... Uh, uh, of these, these, trench, these trenches, one of the things that we looked at in particular was this possible machine gun emplacement. Uh, you can see here, these are some uh, Royal Engineers uh, uh, plans from, I think this is 1921 Royal Engineers uh, book of uh, military, uh, military uh, fortifications. And these are our potential machine gun positions as part of the Barry Budden uh, First World War trenches. You can see there's remains here at the bottom of wood. So this is still in situ. Uh, <clears throat> machine guns are obviously very well known in the First World War for uh, being a very good defence weapon. However, they were also used in the attack. They were used for machine gun barrages, firing over the, into the trenches. Uh, so this is possibly something to do with that because this was quite far forward in the, uh, the lines of the, the trenches that we found it. So it's most likely uh, something to do with an attack going in and it would be used to cover uh, soldiers as they're pressing forward. And we also obviously excavated the trenches themselves and you can see here this is a post-ex photograph of one of the trenches. Uh, points out some of the points, very nice sharp cuts into the sand and you can actually see as well uh, some of the remains of the tipped in sandbags. It took us a little while to work out what some of these stripes were on the sides, but there are actually sandbags that are still in place. Uh, the only thing is the hessian of the sandbag itself has rotted off, so what you're getting is tiger striping left from the uh, original material that's been put into the sandbags and left there. And you can see that more clearly in this photograph. You see the stripes here, looks very much like a kebab. And we also uh, found as well some of the remains of some of the revetting pieces, some of the trench furniture that you would get in uh, the trenches to hold back these uh, sides. A uh, slight close up on that. So you can see this would have been a trench post stuck in, uh, into the ground and held back with wire to hold back the sandbags that are literally still in situ here. Now, this was what was called a breastwork. Everybody think, probably thinks of trenches when they think of them, they think of them as being below ground. Breastworks were actually built above ground in areas where the water table was quite high. So in places like Flanders, you have a, a clay line which holds the water and it means you can't dig trenches very deep. So the trenches in Flanders from about 1915 onwards were actually only dug for about about a, a foot below the ground, but then they will be built up with these breastworks, but literally sandbags on either side, uh, to up to about six, eight foot on either side of the trenches. And this is what's happening at Barry Budden. Now, as far as I'm aware, this is probably the only place in the UK that this is, we've actually found these. But there's a lot of training trenches all the way across the UK, uh, from, dating from the First World War, but these ones are pretty unique as far as I know. Uh, if I'm wrong, please tell me, but, uh, I don't think I've seen any others that have been excavated like this with the sandbags uh, above ground. And we also found other bits and pieces as well as part of this. Uh, so we had <coughs> these uh, a massive amount of uh, barbed wire dumped back in. So this is part of the, uh, the digging of the trenches in the Royal Engineers books. Uh, they have barbed wire in front, obviously, as a, 
uh, a defence against anybody attacking. Uh, this had gone out of use at some point, and all this stuff had been pushed back in. The two guys that you can see digging, pulling this barbed wire out, uh, are veterans. As I say, Operation Nightingale is about veterans. It's about uh, helping people with various uh, mental health issues, such as PTSD or even physical injuries uh, caused by combat, uh, combat stress. And archaeology is very good for this. We now have a growing body of evidence shows that archaeology is actually very good for helping these guys on a pathway to recovery with PTSD. Uh, Breaking Ground Heritage do a, uh, a questionnaire before the projects and at the end of them, and there is evidence to show that these guys feel a lot better by the end of the projects. Uh, it helps with isolationism, it helps with all kinds of different uh, issues that these guys deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not a cure-all, it doesn't cure people, but it helps on their pathways to recovery, and that's you know one of the main things that we run these Operation Nightingale projects uh, for. So as I said, we have you know, the original uh, engineers' plans of the trenches, and the ones at Barry Budden match up very, very well with the original, these are 1920s uh, trench, uh, trench uh, manuals. So these are just after the First World War, so they're using the lessons that they learned in the First World War about trench digging, etc. And you can see, so we have the crenellated front line trench, uh, a bit like a castle wall, uh, top of a castle wall, with the zigzag of the communication trench coming down the back. And these were all replicated in the Barry Budden uh, field works that we found. You can also see as well, this is the breastworks, as I mentioned. So this is all built up with sandbags and earth. We even had this borrow pit at the front at Barry Budden uh, and the, uh, the smaller, much shallower trench just behind here. So this matched up pretty much exactly with what they were writing in their 1920s uh, <coughs> engineer books, Royal Engineer books. And I mentioned the Alan Williams turret. So we, as I say, this was mentioned on, uh, it's, it's, it's marked on Canmore as an Alan Williams turret. There's also another one at Barry Budden. There's another one up at Lucas, and there's another one as well, which I just can't remember off the top of my head where, the, uh, where it is, but it's somewhere up in Scotland. The Alan Williams turrets were a airfield defence that were built, well, they, they were made in about 1940. It was a reaction to the potential German invasion of 1940, and one of the many myriad of uh, airfield defences and defence things that popped up in Britain at the time. There was actually 100, I think 199 of the Alan Williams turrets built, uh, that, and of those, I think something only like five or six probably survive now. There's one in the Imperial War Museum. So, you know, we were very excited to think, well, pot potentially we've got this Alan Williams turret. You know, it's, again, relatively unique from a Second World War defence point of view. Uh, so we excavated it. And as you can see... Oh, sorry. Gone the wrong way. As you can see, press the wrong button there. As you can see, it comes all the way down. It's sat in this concrete plinth at the bottom. as a hole in here to get into. You could probably just get one man in it. And from this, because we could only see the top of it, we very quickly realised it's not actually an Alan Williams turret. And we've got no idea what it is. Uh, an Alan Williams turret is very different because an Alan Williams turret would have had a separate cupola on the top for one man to be able to move around while the other man fired his brain gun out of it. God knows how you'd do that, but apparently that was how they're supposed to be used. As I say, there's a couple of these up here uh, at Barry Budden, so there's at least two in Barry Budden, there's another one at Lucas. Uh, they're look overlooking what are potentially old uh, airfields from the Second World War. Uh, we don't know if they were being used as observation posts while people are training in the trenches. They're most likely Second World War. The only other photograph I've ever seen of one of these is what looks like a 1940s roadside scene uh, with a British Army soldier in 1940s kit with a uh, Bobby standing next to him and we've got literally the same, exactly the same layout of this thing, even with this little thing on top as well. But we don't know what they are, we've never been able to find them. So again, please, if you've got any answers for that, uh, send them on a postcard to the usual address. And as I say, you know, Operation Nightingale is about the soldiers, it's about the, the veterans, it's about the, uh, the men who, who have been through combat, who are dealing with various uh, mental health issues and uh, physical injuries as well. 
uh, in this photograph, everybody working are veterans. Everybody not working are professional archaeologists. Uh, these are the, the, the guys from Wessex. They're the ones who are basically making sure that everything is put together properly. They produce the report for us at the end of it. They make sure that everything is recorded while we're on site and teach the, uh, the, uh, the participants, the, uh, the nightingales as we call them, uh, teach them the, you know, the basic archaeological works. And as, you, as I say, as you can see, these guys are just basically mucking in. Operation Nightingale Gale is great for archaeology for, for veterans working with archaeology because archaeology is all about uh, attention to detail. It's about you know taking your time, uh, methodically working through uh, bits and pieces, going through layers one at a time. You know I don't need to tell you this; you all know this anyway. Uh, but it's also great as well because what we're doing is we're taking them back to some of the areas where some of these guys may have trained, giving them a different view on those areas. Uh, and also, it's just bringing them back as, as a team as well. And one of the things I've noticed when I'm working with Operation Nightingale participants is sometimes you work with, you know, students or various uh, different groups within archaeology, within community archaeology, and it takes a little while for the group just to get to know each other. People break off into different cliques. With these guys, it doesn't seem to happen. What happens is almost by the end of the day, there's a banter flying around, you're getting literally the piss taken out of you by you know five o'clock on the first day and if you show any weakness whatsoever you know they'll exploit it uh, but if you're part of that team you know you are literally part of that team even if it's just for these short couple of weeks uh, and it you know it goes on as well because they they continue to stay in touch afterwards as well as part of this so you know it really does work even anecdotally uh, the just the experience that they get out of it is is good for them and as I say, we don't just have them shifting soil. We, they are, they're not just there as, as uh, bucket monkeys. We teach them every aspect of archaeology from ground up, literally. So these are you know, photos just to demonstrate that in these pictures, every one of these guys is a veteran being taught how to plan, uh, how to do section drawing, how to level even, you know, even the old basic ways of doing leveling, all these kind of things that you normally take for granted as an archaeologist. So what we're trying to do is, again, really give them uh, just different skills, vocational and transferable skills, you know, to a certain extent, just to help them, uh, you know, feel a little bit better about coming on one of these things. They've actually learned something, so they're not just literally shifting muck. And also we've had ties with uh, University of Dundee as well, uh, because through Wessex Archaeology, uh, one of the project managers is married to one of the forensic archaeologists at the uh, University of Dundee. I mean, who says that archaeologists don't breed outside of their, their group? Uh, and because of that, she was able to get us into the forensic labs at Dundee University. And again, basically give these guys, you know, uh, a brief uh, look at some of the osteological uh, work that they do there. Just introduce them to, again, a different side of life, a different side of archaeology even. And, you know, just to teach them through some of these things uh, that, again, sometimes we take, as, uh, take for granted as archaeologists. Uh, this uh, guy in the centre, this is Dickie Bennett. Uh, he's the guy that runs Breaking Ground Heritage. He, as I say, was an ex-Royal Marines sergeant, came along to a Operation Nightingale project on Salisbury Plain and then set up Breaking Ground Heritage on the back of that. And he is now so busy that we can't even get hold of him to get up north to come and support some of our projects he's trying his needs to put in new staff up here so we can have our projects supported because he's so busy down at salisbury which i think is a fantastic thing still needs to pay himself a wage though and of course you know we find stuff uh everybody you know everybody likes features you know like me we all do we're all archaeologists but uh, everybody also likes treasure don't they you know and some of the stuff I've seen so far today, and some of the stuff I'm going to see later on, is, is pretty good, but it's nowhere near as good as three or three bullets, is it, really? <laughs> you know, these are scattered all over the place. These are relatively undateable, used from literally the early, uh, early 20th century through to about 1960, 1970s. Uh, relatively undateable in this state when it's just the bullet head. However, we also found uh, this tin here, which gave one of our vets a chance to actually clean it up. Uh, getting nicely photographed, recorded in situ. It's just a, a, an old food tin, but you know, it just gave him a day's worth of basically cleaning up uh, what most people would sometimes consider rubbish. 
felt a bit system if we pulled it out, but that's not the point. And like me, I'm sure you're all really excited about bullets. Uh, and we did find a massive range of uh, ammunition stretching all the way across, all the way from the 19th century onwards with these things here, these uh, Schneider rounds. These are late 19th century. Uh, these ones here as well, these are uh, part of the Schneider uh, family of bullets. We also found uh, down in the corner here, these are Webley rounds. So these were the uh, British Army issued uh, rifle, uh, not rifle, sorry, uh, pistol of the First World War, late 19th century to uh, mid 20th century. But more importantly, and uh, dateable, were these two rounds, this one here and this one here. These are 303 rounds, standard British round, uh, used all the way through the First World War. Uh, every, every bullet that is produced has a stamp head on it, which has a date on it. So from an archaeological point of view, it's fantastic. Uh, all the ones that we'd found were late uh, 50s, 40s, and they were higher up in the, in the trench fill, so when things had been backfilled. These two were actually stuck into the parapets, into the wooden, um, the, uh, the rev revetting material of the parapets, and they were both dated 1911. So it's possibly old stocks that's been used up for training in these uh, ranges as where they're being used in the First World War. So although it's not 1914 to 18, you know, it's giving us a relatively good date as to when these things were actually built. And also, of course, you know, we found lots of other uh, bits and pieces of, uh, uh, of military equipment like uh, 1970s plum jam. Uh, part of the, uh, the menu sheet, you can see here the 24-hour rations. Uh, so we found these in situ. Uh, probably wouldn't like to try them, I don't think. Uh, sticking with the food, we also found mess plates uh, dated to 1940s and 1943. Fantastic. This is brilliant stuff. As I say, you know, early medieval, yeah, it's okay. This is really what we're talking about right here. Uh, we also found underneath the barbed wire that you saw this GS shovel, uh, standard pattern British shovel, uh, obviously signed out of stores and never signed back in again, so probably somebody was on a fizzer for that. And of course, as I say, you know, we, ha we, we as archaeologists, we like a lot of treasure, and we were no different really at Barry Budden as well, because, you know, we find hordes all over Britain. Uh, there's the, the Anglo-Saxon hordes that recently come to light from metal detectorists. Well, Barry Budden, we can beat that with the Barry Budden horde of rusted tin food tins. And, yeah, it doesn't get much better than that, does it, from an archaeological point of view, as far as I'm concerned. And with that in mind, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>